Okay. Oh, a bit echoey. <laughs> Um, first of all, I really have to thank Daryl for covering over the last two weeks uh, and especially last week when uh, I sort of finished my obligation to Christian Life Ministries and I uh, turned on just to see how he was going and for the first 20 minutes I was so angry with him because it looked like he was going to drop um, and I was, I was really concerned so I, I sent him a a pastoral text saying, don't you ever do that again. Um, and I said, you could have texted me, I might have been 15 minutes late. But he is, he's like me. Once you get behind this wooden thing, you just, nothing can stop you. You're like a bulldozer, you know what I mean? Um, and, and so I was uh, very, very thankful for that. Um, but he still hasn't forgiven me. Uh, because when he got here last week, he searched around there, he searched around there, he said to Eric, he said to John, he said, where's the pulpit? And because he hates that, that black thing like I do. It's like putting a, a, a barrier between you and me. And, um, and he said, I'll bet that side's pinched it. And I did too. I can't preach without this. And, even, and, and, and so I had to come down at 9 o'clock in the morning and, and take it home. Uh, so, uh, you know, it'll be about a month before he speaks to me again. Uh, but last week was really interesting. It was a privilege to speak to Christian Life Ministries Online. And uh, it was supposed to be live, but get a load of this. Uh, they uh, have been in a building... Uh, in Scarborough that is uh, governed by the city of Stirling and without any warning all three churches in that building were um, kicked out with no, no notice whatsoever uh, and so um, where I was supposed to be going I did it live uh, and even though I do it live and some of you from years ago would have seen me when we were in lockdown I still had this thing in the library and, and on YouTube this thing here um, there was a little church in Chewett Hill about 22 years ago that closed down and one of Sue's friends was a, a congregant there and the, the elder said, look, if you want anything from the church, please just take it because we, we're, we're going to bulldoze the place and build houses. And uh, so Katie w went up and grabbed this thing and said to Sue, give it to Stuart, give it to Stuart. Um, and so I've had it for 22 years and, and I just love it. Um, I often think oh, I should probably polish it up a bit, but I don't think we're going to be here long enough. Um, and I gave a message last week on Romans 13. This is the one that um, I, I did a, a trial run. And I was somewhat sort of tremulous because uh, I just find it impossible to be anyone else but me. And do you know what I mean? You have to get used to me because I can be quite up front. Um, and and that is sometimes... Um, controversial for some people who like pastors just to whisper quietly and, uh, and then qu finish quickly and then uh, go home. But that's not like me. And it's, uh, it's a very cr confronting message and it's nothing like you've ever heard before on that passage and I can't wait to give it to you uh, at the start of March. And as my son and daughter-in-law were my live audience, they came down and sat in front of me and brought their beautiful 17-month-old um, daughter with them and that was my audience, and they have been loyal to that church for many, many years. And I felt uh, like I was on the edge of a very high cliff. Do you know what? The, the relationship between a pastor who is really a pastor, who is a shepherd of his people, the relationship between a pastor and a congregation is like parent and child. You don't like lending them out to anyone. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and this is what uh, um, Rob's been... A, minister, a pastor of that church for 30 years. And so uh, his, all of his children and even our, our kids grew up uh, for the last 10, 15 years in that church. Uh, and uh, uh, it was quite funny because when I was setting up for it, I put my pulpit in, in the lounge where we have Bible studies on Wednesday nights. And I lifted my heavy Bible up, put it on there, and I put my wad of notes on this side and our granddaughter was sort of staring at me wondering what on earth I was doing and it's like she looked at the notes and thought to herself well there's an hour and a half I'll never get back so she took <laughs> off 
and, and she played with Sue for the next hour and a half. Um, and it, it was quite, quite way, you know, amazing. And three weeks ago, oh, I, before I get that, I have to tell you, this is encouragement. We're going through a, a, a whole sweep through the Bible so I can get rid of this whole concept um, of what we're dealing with now with our premier, with what's happening in Australia, um, and the, the dirty tricks that the government's going to start, I think, playing on, especially those people in Canberra at the moment. Um, apparently, uh, there's nearly a million people there. If that doesn't make a statement to a government, what does? Um, but uh, our tech guy up there spotted something that was really quite worrying. I don't know if you saw it on the chat. Um, but it was a four-wheel drive parked in a paddock near the crowd, and it has a, about a one-metre radar dish on sitting on top, and it's called an LRAD, and it's a low-frequency radar a, 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 a array device. And what it does is it actually sends out a very low-frequency signal, and it's like a giant subwoofer um, shaking all of your organs, in your body uh, and the possibility of uh, brain damage, burst eardrums, tinnitus and various other things. And I'm thinking this government is going mental. Uh, and I don't think there's anyone else like it, this government except Justin Trudeau, who is, who is quite frankly insane. Uh, and, and that's the that problem, but you see, uh, when, when, you know that second song we sung, The Battle is the Lord's? That is so true. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was concerned uh, for a period of time that some people thought that w we were going to be the church of the resistance. And I have to tell you this right now. We serve two objects in this church. A, we glorify God and Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the other thing is, is to get the lost saved... And then once we get them saved, I want to get them to a, a level of maturity that when every one of you get up there and stand alone before Jesus, and he's going to look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful service, servant. That is what I want for you. And there are things that we're going to do, uh, I personally am going to do in the near future, but it will done, be done legally. Because I'll tell you right now, What's happening around Europe and the pullback all throughout Europe is because of the Nuremberg II trial that has started in Canada. Because the one thing these they're not afraid of your protests in the middle of Perth or in the middle of anywhere. But what they are afraid of is a court case naming them as defendants. Do you understand? Because they don't know whether or not the judges will show... Um, um, uh, integrity and sovereignty and independence and come down with a decision that's going to severely hurt them. That's what worries them. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on in, in, in a couple of aspects over the next few months. Um, but we had such a God week this week. Uh, the first thing that turned up is <laughs> we really need a new church, right? Because we're just pushing the boundaries here so bad, we're probably close to breaking fire regs. So um, we're getting pressure put on us uh, from our um, landlords. And uh, so th the first great thing was um, we had an architect draw up a model of our future church. <laughs> and, all, and it's got a little pulpit in there, exactly like this pulpit, <laughs> and, and it's got seats and everything like that. This is made by the prisoner that I visit every now and again in Hakia Prison. And this guy has turned around so phenomenally um, since, you know, I've been going down there and meeting him. And he was so thrilled that I was going to show it to you guys um, this week. It's just amazing. It was either that we build a new one or I shrink the lot of you every Sunday to get into that. <laughs> the rent would be cheap, the rent. So that was the best thing. And then um, on Sunday afternoon, I said to the, to the board, I sent a text to the board saying, listen, we've got to start really pushing about getting um, uh, a new premise. And uh, so Stu, the, 
music work, worship leader sent uh, the whole board a little text about a pretty grotty looking building just around here on Wharton Road. And uh, it's a big one. It used to be used for indoor cricket and on indoor soccer, all right? Uh, it's on the Holy Mile along there on Wharton Road. And I said to the board, OK, well, I'll go down on Tuesday and have a look at it and, uh, and video it. So I was down there Tuesday morning, and lo and behold, Lynn Doyle, the, the treasure, was around the corner. And I said to Lynn, OK, you send an email to the real estate agent, because I thought it was the real estate agent that um, Stu had sent it to us. And I said, I'll leave a phone message. And they, she said, right. And so I went back to the car, got in the car, left a phone message on this number, and I hadn't got along to the lights at Garden Street and turning up to go back to the um, Row Highway when I got this phone call. And I said, hello, Stuart Mark speaking, and it was, you just left me a message, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, oh, um, oh, thank you for calling back. I, I'm the pastor <laughs> of a church, and, um, and uh, we were just looking at that, your, your building on, on Wharton Road. Uh, and he said, are you a church? And I said, yeah. He said, no, nah, there's already a church, got it. Uh, so that you'll have to look somewhere else. I said, all right. I said, thank you for ringing back and, uh, and your courtesy. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I said, we were really looking for something, you know, to lease for 10 years, 20 years. And, um, and he said, hang on, hang on, how long? And I said, um, you know, well, it's substantial. And he said, all right, so for someone who didn't want to talk to me, I was on the phone uh, for about an hour and seven minutes to him. I was still parked in my driveway at my home in Dianella, still talking to him. I got his life history, his health history, <laughs> everything that you could imagine. Um, and I could, and yeah, and it was, it, was, it was amazing. And it's like we're best friends now, all right? And, and and let me tell you what he said. I, 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 it would take me an hour to distill everything that he said. But he basically said, I want to develop that land and I want to develop the back half. And he said, if you're prepared to lease it for that long, I'm going to build you a church so that you can lease it. I can't believe it. So he said, do you know anyone on the council? I said, yeah we're, yeah, we're good friends with Peter Abetz. Well, ring him and see what you need. So, OK, all right. And so I did, and I rang Peter, and Peter knows this guy really well. He's got bucket loads of land all around the southeast here. Um, but he won't spend the money, you know, to, to, to develop it. But it, he will, he, do, he builds factories, I'll give him the credit. So anyway, um, Peter said, uh, why, did, why were you talking to John? And I said, well, we were looking at that building on, on Wharton Road, 296. And he said, Stuart. And, he, and I said, and he wants to know what we need to do to get an application through council. And, uh, and, I, and John said, there's some anti-church people in the council. He said, no, Stuart, they're all gone. He said, we're quite happy to, to um, approve a church. And so uh, he said... The funny thing is, Stuart, though, is that 18 months ago, John ap applied to develop that land, and we gave him immediate approval to do so. So if he starts with the bulldozers and the graders tomorrow, we would be more than delighted to have him do it. You see what I mean? So now I've got to get sort of like a rocket and, and, and do it. So, but just for that to come out of that, do you know what I mean? And the other thing is, we've got a guy here who um, some of your kids love in the children's church. And Sue and I went to see them on Friday. Uh, and he's got really bad problems with his kidneys. His function is nearly z zero. And um, this is how God this thing was. Um, he has to now start dialysis, all right? And the problem is, you've either got um, Armadale, Cannington, or Fiona. And the guy that is going to offer to build our church, he's had the same kidney problems. And he's just had a transplant. And he said, Stuart, all the years of, of um, pain and discomfort and having to go here, there and everywhere trying to get um, appointments for it, 
He said, um, in, in association with your church, I'm going to build a big centre, a big medical centre, and I'm going to put a dialysis unit in that medical centre. I mean, and what I'm doing is I'm pulling the phone away from my ear and looking at it and saying, you know, th this is just beyond belief. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, we've got that process going. So please pray for it. Please, please pray. Um, if, if in the short term we can use that um, facility, there's another church that m would meet there in, in the morning. There was a very small church, and we can meet there in the afternoon. And the great thing is there's no one behind us. So I can preach for three hours in that sort of thing. <laughs> And I can. I can. <laughs> so that was, that was absolutely brilliant. And one of the things that's important about that church from, from Ben and Hakea was um, I went to see him, visit him on the 20th of January. And because I'm exempt, uh, they said, yeah, you can come in. I got there on 20th of January. And they said, no, sorry, um, we've changed it. It's only double vax can go in now, so you can't come in. I said, okay, all right, I'm, you know, I'm not going to jump up and down. So I went back to the little gatehouse where these two ladies are that give you the, the key for your locker and that sort of thing. And, I, and they said, what are you doing back? I said, well, they won't let me in. Wow, did they hit the roof? Because they said, well, we don't know who to let in and who not to let in now. They've broken the rules. So this bossy little lady, um, just love them, you know what I mean? <laughs> She said, you'll sit right down there and you'll write a letter to the superintendent and explain what's happened and show them all your paperwork. So I did. It took me about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and I said to the superintendent, take your prison, put it in. Thursday morning, I get a phone call. And um, Sue answered it and, and handed it over. And, and I said, yeah, Stuart Marks. And he said, uh, hi, this is Bill, deputy superintendent of Hakea Prison. And I said, Bill, how are you? He said, that's good. He said, I've just read your letter. And he says, I cannot work out why we refused you entry on the 20th of January. So first of all, I apologise for that. And the second thing was, I've gone through all of your paperwork. We've discussed everything that we're legally supposed to do. And he said, you can come to Hakea any time you like. <laughs> so he sent me a letter to that account and he said, you bring it with you. And if you have any problems at the front gate, show them the letter and ask them to come and get me. So um, that was really, that, that, that's another God thing. Do you see what I mean? And, um, and the third thing, um, this is like getting spiritual diabetes, too much sugar, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but Sue and I were in bed early Wednesday morning having breakfast as we do. Uh, that's what old people are allowed to do. Um, and, uh, and I got a ding on my phone, and I sort of looked at it, and I read it, and Sue was reading her um, word for the day thing, and I just went and showed it to her. And she said, you're kidding me. And I said, no. And it was Amir Safadi um, texting me saying, is there any chance I can come to Western Australia this year? <laughs> Uh, I said, can you get Mossad to do something about the Premier? But, uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's an ongoing discussion there. Uh, but the, the funny thing was, um, Trudy, where's Trudy? Is Trudy here? Da, 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 not here. Um, she sent some documents, um, uh, put them on uh, 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 one of the chats, and I um, downloaded 19 pages of it, and it was the Act in 2003 for WA uh, stipulating everything that you couldn't do uh, under a health management uh, uh, um, disaster. And here in this thing on uh, about page 14 is... Um, the approved vaccines for this health measure, this is 2003 with a spike vax. How did they know about spike vaxes back then? And a couple of other ones that sound terribly like Moderna and AstraZeneca. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just thinking, 
that's why I want to finish off this sweep through the Bible uh, this week on, on the origin of, of evil, because you have to understand that you and I as children of God are constantly in battle. Yes, amen. Do you know what I mean? It is a constant fight uh, against the uh, principalities and powers in high places. Uh, and, and this is the, the real um, battle that we, we need to do. But you see, I wrote a very polite letter to the superintendent of the, the um, prison, not jumping up and down, not spitting the dummy, not doing things like that, just um, put, put in the facts that happened that I was disappointed that I wasn't allowed to come in and all my health um, um, information that he needed to know. And so that just shows you, and, and I was very kind to the guy that rang up, says, what do you want? Um, uh, and see what happens? Uh, and so at the end of the day, I want to represent this church as a godly church, obeying the rules, but moving forward um, and not being pushed back. Uh, but you do it with God. You don't do it on your own. Flesh will never overcome flesh. Do you understand? It's spirit and the battle is the Lord's. And he's just shown me this week in all of those three things that um, if, you, if you keep doing what I tell you to do, Stuart, things will open up. And so I, that's the where we're going. So three weeks ago, I taught that the origin of evil is recorded in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses uh, 11 to 19. We're not going to go there. I've been there time and time again. Uh, and the passage reveals the perfection of Lucifer as the anointed cherub. So he's number one in the angelic realm. Anointed uh, and, and uh, uh, created by God. The scriptures de describe his attributes and his position relative to the triune Godhead in that it emphasizes he was created. Not like the Mormons say that he and Jesus are brothers. Just like you and me, we are created beings. But in the most dramatic of statements, iniquity was found in his heart. And, and you know, I've, I've taught this time and time again. A lady, a lovely lady, two weeks ago came up to me after the cafe and said, oh, we've just come out of a church and we've never, ever heard our pastor talk anything about revelation. Um, would you talk, revela talk, teach Revelation one day? And I thought, well, I might do it as a separate one and stick it on YouTube underneath the normal ones because Matthew's warned me um, that if I don't get back to his gospel, then fire and brimstone may come <laughs> down upon me. Uh, and, and the next passage in, in uh, Matthew is just a meeting between Jesus and a centurion, but it brings in the 75-day interval between Jesus' return and the inauguration of the, uh, the tribulation. It, it, it just is such a powerful passage, and so many people just skate over the top of it and don't even see what's in it. So we're going back to Matthew and... Um, and then our break will be um, on the first Sunday in March with uh, Augusto and I. And the problem is, and don't look at um, Satan and say, oh, what a horrible person is, because the same thing that afflicted him afflicts us. And John's made up a, um, a little slide. And you, th those of you who have been with me for a long time know this, right? If you go from Lucifer, what's the middle letter? In the name. What's the middle lame uh, letter in pride? What's the middle letter in sin? What's the top one? That's you and I. We all have problems with pride, with vanity, with hurt feelings, with misapplied good intentions. And this is where um, Lucifer fell because he was um, the famous five I wills in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. We won't go there, we've done it before. There's, it's on a couple of teachings past. But that's the, that's the problem with pride and vanity. And can you look around the political world at the moment and see vanity and pride and arrogance in these people? You know, it, it, it's just... You know, I, I'm doing this so that we understand the battle that we have in front of us. And thus the punishment of Satan because of this uh, evil, this pride, this rebellion against God, was expulsion from the presence of God, uh, of God 
to become God, little g, of this world and the prince of the power of the air. And in like fashion, Adam was created in divine perfection as the perfect man. And likewise, Eve, until Satan, that is, Lucifer the light bearer became Satan, the adversary, entered into the garden and put a proposition to Eve. And I've heard some Christians over the last 30 years say to me, oh, if I was in the garden, I would never have done that. (laughs) I just finished saying that Adam was created the perfect man. More intelligent, ruling over the uh, earth at the time, had named all the animals, was doing everything that God asked of him, and you think you can outdo Adam? I don't think so. And so he entered the garden, put a proposition to Eve, and he called into question God's veracity or truthfulness and told Eve that the only reason she was told not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil in the midst of the garden was that God did not want mankind to be equal with God. There's so many misinterpretations of Scripture that really bug me. And the worst is misrepresentation of what the word of God actually says. And that's why the Romans 13 uh, passage is so powerful. But in this instance, 1 Timothy 2.14 records that Eve was deceived by the subtle craft of Satan and ate. But when she offered the fruit to Adam... And I've got this in brackets in my notes. It's inferred that she told Adam the same premise that the serpent told her, that he could be like God. That's the deal. And don't you see around the world today these political leaders acting like God? They are without recourse to any morality whatsoever. And I just see what Justin Trudeau is doing in Canada. And God bless the truckers and God bless the people in Canberra. It's just, um, at least it's showing that there's a, there's a spirit there. Um, and so Adam, listen to this, in full knowledge and understanding, rebelled against God. All he ever had to do was to obey one command. One command. Moses gave Israel 613, and as I said to you two weeks ago, scholars have been through the New Testament and have counted so far and are still looking a 1,000 commands in the New Testament under the law of Christ. One, 613, more than a 1,000, and he couldn't keep one. He couldn't keep one. He just thought... There are so many people that I have met in my career and my life, especially in the mining game, where uh, I was part of a four-man management team that built one of the biggest mines in in the gold fields, and it's still going 23 years later. But one of the things I've always noticed is that number two in any management structure often wants to be number one. They think they can do a better job. This is what Adam thought. I'm sick and tired of taking orders on how to run this world. I think I'll do it my way. How many times have you and I in our life have decided to do things our way? And how's it gone? No, not good. That's why creation itself, when he sinned, collapsed down to three and a half dimensions with the other six and a half curled down to a dimension where they have no locality, uh, but they retain existence. And now you'll see why I love Chuck Missler so much, because um, so many people's eyes start to spin and say, what does that all mean? uh, it, It really means that the creation, when Adam and Eve were first ruling and reigning over the earth in obedience to God, there was a dimensionality that we don't even understand. And we get a hint of it when Jesus is resurrected in his new body and there's six disciples locked into a room terrified for their lives. And what does Jesus do? Walks through a solid wall. And then he says to them, I'm not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and... No. No. Bone. 
You don't have blood in a resurrection body. Why not? Because that's the cleansing system of our fallen bodies. Do you understand? It's nourishment and cleansing. We don't need nourishment and cleansing up there. We're perfect. No more hematologists for me. That's brilliant. <laughs> and so what, one of the things you understand is, you know, if you've ever done, who's done the 24 hours, the Bible in 24 hours with Chuck Missler? How much of a migraine did you get in hour two? I love that hour. I, Sue skips over it, says, let's get to the real thing, you know. But it's all about what I'm talking about. That particle um, uh, physicists in the 20th spent, century spent hundreds of hours with supercomputers coming to the conclusion that this uh, uh, creation exists in 10 dimensions. Do you know that? They found that out in the last century, that it exists in 10 d dimensions, but six and a half of them are invisible. Now, they could have saved all that money if only they'd read the workings of Maimonides, a Jewish rabbi in Spain in the 12th century, because he said in his writings that this creation has 10 divisions. A little old man reading the scriptures, Genesis, under a candlelight, worked out what particle physicists with supercomputers came to the conclusion that this creation has been shrunk down because of Adam's rebellion. And what we don't understand is in the new heavens and the new earth, we'll be restored to that dimensionality. Do you understand? And there won't be time, there'll be eternity. And people say, oh, but it says from Sabbath to Sabbath and new moon to new moon. That's rhythm. That is not time. You do not grow old in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't care how you deal with the word eternity, but you ain't going to be one year older in eternity ever. Do you understand? God, your heavenly father, is not one second older than he was a trillion years ago. Do you understand? He doesn't age. There is no time. Time is a measure of decay. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Whatever was perfect is decaying and will reach a state of dead normalcy. That's what this whole creation is, is um, uh, bound for, except for Colossians, I think, 1.16, where Jesus upholds everything by the power of his right hand. And you know what? A uh, astrophysicist lost his job about 10 years ago in England when he took a paper that he had developed that this uh, uh, creation is so unstable that it requires energy input from the outside. And everyone laughed at him and kicked him out. Well, if they'd read Colossians, they would have seen that what he said was exactly the truth. It's kept by Jesus for the correct time. And that is the end of Revelation chapter 20, when the earth and the, he and the heavens will flee from his very presence. So in Satan, rebelling in the angelic realm, Revelation 12 informs us that he took one third of the angelic realm with him in Adam's rebellion as the physical progenitor of all humanity, every single human being, every one of you and I, are tainted genetically by the evil of Adam's rebellion. Do you understand that? And when we pick up our beautiful little 17-month-old um, granddaughter, we find, we think we, she's perfect, all right? Our son said to our wife last Sunday, she said, I think I would have been, it would have been better if I had a son, mum. I can relate to a boy, but she's telling me off already, and she's 17 <laughs> months old. And he says, I don't know what to do with her. Oh, she's a character. She, she gives you a look like this. Um, but in, 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 So we're tainted by uh, the evil of... Ever. Have you ever gone on one of these exercises on TV where they um, encourage you to trace back your family tree? Have you ever done that? Be very careful if they ask for your uh, sample of your DNA. Be very careful. Because that doesn't stay with... Ancestry.com, it gets sent to other people. Ah, why do you think they promote 
you know, this send us your DNA and we'll tell you how many races are in you. Well, listen, there's only one race. It's called the human one. And we've only got one ancestor, and that his name is Adam. And you can trace your family tree all the way back to him. Do you understand that? You might be able... Like, I come from... Um, my, my mum and dad come from Cornwall in Scotland, so I might be able to go back three or 400 years because of church records. After that, it'll get a bit hazy. If you're royal, you might be even able to go back further. But by the time in England you get back to uh, the time of Alfred and all the rest of it, it gets very, very shaky. So you can't go back that far. But you go back, I'm telling you right now, in an unbroken chain to this man who tainted our gen genome. Do you understand? And it's his fault. If you take this book, it is his fault. I'm blaming him. If you take this book, which isn't, mind you, I would have done that if I was there as Adam, and so would you have. If you take this book, which is in my hand, that's the Bible, and read it from cover to cover, it's drenched in evil and rebellion. Um, that's the thing that staggered me when I first became a really um, um, avid reader of the scriptures. And even evil, angelic corruption of human DNA occurred in Genesis chapter 6. Hello, any relevant, re relevance to the current time? People want to muck your DNA up. The flood, and only three generations after the flood, we have the Tower of Babel. We have Abraham having to war against four Elamite kings who took Lot and family hostage after the looting of the five cities of the plain of the Dead Sea. Within half a generation of that, Jesus had to send two angels to call down fire and brimstone from heaven on Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, and Adma. Watch which one wasn't destroyed. Zoar, why not? Because Lot was there. The righteous was in there. Jesus said, I cannot destroy it because the righteous are in there. Whew. Are you all pleased you're born again believers? <laughs> Within, uh, yeah, and so which city, yeah, which city was spared? And after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, the exodus, the rebellion of those who left Egypt but never ever entered Canaan, because of the rebellion and the collective rebellion of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, the evil of their enemies, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and every atrocity that's happened over the last 2,000 years. And look at our present time. You know, I can, I can remember um, I was eight years old. And we, I was in the kitchen with mum at lunchtime because the school, our primary school was just straight over the road so we used to come home um, and have lunch with mum. And we had this little Baker light radio that sat high up on the wall on a little shelf. And I'll never forget, um, mum was sobbing her heart out because the midday news had just come on and had announced that President John Fitzgerald Kennedy had just been assassinated. And she was sobbing, and she said, who would do such an evil thing? And when I get back to Jekyll at some stage in the future, um, I'll, I'll tell you who did it. It was the six men who went to Jekyll Island to establish the Federal Reserve system that um, assassinated Robert Ken uh, John Kennedy and his brother Bobby in 1998. Why? because they were going to take the Federal Reserve out of private hands and put it back into the US Treasury. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, Chuck mentioned uh, when he was still alive, so that would be about 10, 15 years ago, and this is 10 or 15 years ago, he said there is a, a, a believable estimate, a believable estimate that at this time the Rothschilds are worth a net $500 trillion. Can you imagine that? And the Rockefellers, $200 trillion. Where did they get all that money from? The US Federal Reserve. Because it's not US, it's not federal, it's not a government, it's not a reserve, and it's not a system. It's their private bank. And that's what was developed on Jekyll Island. That's why it's called the creature from Jekyll Island. And what they have done because of that wealth, and, and G. Edward Griffin, um, this guy here lent me the book, and it's so, it's thick, and it, you can't get it in print anymore, they won't print it, you're not allowed to know 
all of that information. Um, so he said, he, he gave it to me last, two Sundays ago, and he said, you damage it or lose it. And he had that look in his eye. So <laughs> I was like this the whole two weeks. So I've still got it there. But do you know the, the ultimate um, uh, outcome of that evil on uh, November the 22nd, 1910, was that they have so much money now they have gone around the world since World War II and they have purchased every government in every nation. Do you understand? They have purchased every... It doesn't matter whether you in this coming election vote for Morrison or Albanese, you're getting the same person. They look different, they sound different, but they obey the same masters. That's the problem. We don't have democ uh, democracy anymore. We have ruled by the US Federal Treasury. It is a disgrace. It is an absolute disgrace. And look now, I'm, I'm waiting for Eric to wave his hands and say Russia's just gone into Ukraine. What's that going to do? That's amazing. Um, and the US has flown soldiers uh, of the 87th Airborne Division in there, NATO's on alert. Lord. And then let's have a look. Get away from what is happening in Ukraine and let's have a look at eschatology. That is the future things. That's one of my favourite things. Um, I, think, I think if Putin goes into Ukraine, that's going to embolden him. Because Martin Armstrong, sometimes I put things by Martin Armstrong on our chat. Uh, and he was um, uh, economic advisor to Margaret Thatcher when they joined the union. And... She was asking him whether they should accept the euro or the pound. And he said, no, you don't go anywhere near the euro. You stay with the pound. He's a very wise person, and he's got contacts all over the world. He holds an alternative conference. You know how Schwab has the World uh, Economic Forum once a year in Davos? Well, um, Martin Armstrong has a, a similar one by genuine people in the same country every year and everyone wants to go to his because he actually tells the truth. But the funny thing was, um, he was saying that with, with that emboldenment, um, the Russian army is so primed at the moment that if they do go into Ukraine, there, would not, there is nothing in Europe to stop them getting to Paris within 30 days. These are the times that you and I are living in. And these are the times that you and I were born for. And sometimes it would have been nice to have been born some other time. <laughs> but we're like Esther. Remember Esther? Yeah. Mordecai was like a bull at a gate. And she was saying, oh, no, if I go and see the king and he doesn't invite me in, he might kill me, what will I do? He said, if you shrink back then God will replace you with someone else. But who knows if you have been born for a time such as this. Uh, any of you going to shrink back? No. You sure? Because this world is not ours. We're going up there. And we're going to be trained up there to come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years in his kingdom. Do you understand that? We're the only group of the redeemed people of God who are called kings and priests. Do you understand that? And we have a job to do for a thousand years. And when I was teaching this years ago, my wife came, uh, when we went home one day, she said, no, nah. she said, you can go down there and do the ruling and reigning. I'm just going to stay up there with, G with God, the Father up there. She said, um, after uh, being a primary school teacher, running children's church and churches, um, um, looking after people in dementia for uh, 23 years. She said, I want to rest. <laughs> and really, um, um, it's, been a tough, it's been a tough gig, really. But the Ezekiel 38-9 war, if he gets into the Ukraine, that's going to heat up the Ezekiel 38-39 war. And that is waiting to, to, to explode. And you know what? I can't understand for the life of me why Iran has developed nuclear weapons to fire at um, 
uh, Israel. Give me a break. Several nuclear bombs in Israel would ha destroy half of Turkey, all of uh, Syria, most of Iraq, most of Jordan, and half of Egypt. I mean, it's, it's insanity. It's like the person we've got in Juma's house can't think straight. Why would you send a nuclear bomb on a country that's the size of a, size of a postage stamp? It doesn't make sense. But you see, it's the insanity that, it's, it, that invades evil people. It's the irrationality that invades e evil, uh, evil people. And that, that invasion, seriously, is on the horizon. And the devastation that actually results from the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, according to verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 6, is that there is a worldwide devastation because God sends punishment down on all the nations that sent mercenaries to that um, attack. And out of that comes the ten regions of a devastated world and ten kings, out of which emerges the little horn of Daniel 7 who becomes the rider on the white horse of Revelation chapter 6. Oh, I must do Revelation again. I love that book. But who does not become the Antichrist? Listen to it. He's the little horn of Daniel for the first three and a half years because he's fighting three kings that don't like him. Do you understand? He doesn't have total control of the world at this time. He's fighting three kings that don't like him and don't want him to be there. So um, at the end of the day, he doesn't become the Antichrist and if I explained to you why, we'd be here till four o'clock. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, but he um, only becomes the, uh, the Antichrist uh, at the very middle of the seven-year tribulation when he kills the two witnesses on the streets of Jerusalem, storms the temple, and takes his place in the Holy of Holies and declares himself as God. God. It's a recurring theme in the Bible right from Lucifer, right at the very start, from Adam, right at the very start, all of these potentates throughout human history, everyone wants to be a god. <sighs> Give me a break, seriously. And he goes into the Holy and the Holies, declares himself God, and during the first half of the tribulation, half of the world's population is killed, and in the second half, the Jewish people worldwide face indescribable persecution, apart from those believers who fled Israel, heeding Jesus' warning in Matthew 24, 15, and that's why you should always read your Bible, because you will know what will happen next. Matthew 24, 15, John. You should all know this is your memory verse. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Do you understand that? You all know of the um, prophecy uh, in Daniel 9, 24 to 27? It's one of the most well-known prophecies in the entire um, Bible. But in that passage, um, there is a warning about uh, the prince of the people who shall come that is, the Roman Empire, uh, will enter into the holy place and stop the ablation and declare himself as God. And these Jewish believers who paid attention to what Matthew recorded Jesus saying, and you know when they, um, they skip, they skip from um, Israel all the way across the Jordan into uh, the city of Petra Bosra, in modern-day uh, Jordan. Why? Because they believed what Jesus said. When you see the abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist going into the holy place and declaring himself God, he says, get out now. And they do. And they make it to Petra Bosra, and they are protected there. But that's not the whole of the um, Jewish people that make it through. Apart from the persecution of the Jewish people at that time who refused to take the mark of the beast which is succinctly described as either his name or the number of his name, which is 666, it's nothing else. Then, in Revelation 19, verse 20, Jesus personally de deals with the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, 1920, John, please. Then the beast was captured. This is when you and I, I hope you're good at equestrian, because we're going to come back with Jesus on white horses. This is when we start to reign with him for a thousand years. Um, I only read, rode a horse once, and um, 
uh, one of my neighbours rode round the back of the horse and rang the bell on his handlebars. <laughs> First and last time I was ever on horse. And we're coming back with him. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And if I was to talk to you one-on-one -on -one, uh, afterwards, I'd say what's particular about that verse. I'm not going to tell you till later. Then the remnant of the army of rebels arrayed against Jesus. This is the kings of the earth and everyone who hates Jesus and doesn't want him coming back is personally destroyed by the command of his very voice. It's, they're destroyed by the very command of his voice. And they to go to hell for a thousand years. Then there is the judgment of the sheep and, goat, uh, uh, sheep and goats in Matthew 25, where the sheep who professed faith in Jesus during the second half of the tribulation, and they demonstrated that faith by assisting the Jews who were being persecuted by Antichrist. These are the... Now, listen, no one ever gets this. So I, sometimes I want to throw something at, at the uh, TV when these YouTubers are trying to describe this whole scenario. They just don't get it. There are gentle believers, Gentile believers, who in their natural human bodies, along with the believing Jewish remnant who are judged by Jesus in the event in Ezekiel 20, 33 to 48, repopulate the earth during the th uh, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. These are natural people, Jews and Gentiles, and they are living normal human beings, believers, who are there at the start of the thousand year reign, and they have kids. You understand? That's how we get a population in the, in the thousand year uh, kingdom of Jesus. And their kids have kids, and their kids' kids have kids. And so that goes on for a thousand years. And at the start of the thousand year reign, Jesus, of Jesus, an angel wraps a chain around Satan and throws him into the pit of hell in verse 3, Revelation 20, verse 3, for a thousand years. And some inattentive teachers infer that because Satan is changed, chained and thrown down, therefore his evil angels must also likewise be sent with him. This is another complete misinterpretation of the scripture. But that is nowhere said in, rapture, uh, in chapter 20 because Revelation 18.2 tells us where all of the evil ones go, the angels go. Revelation 18.2, look at it. And he cried an angel from heaven mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, that's the city in modern day Iraq that was the um, headquarters of Antichrist. It's fallen, it is fallen and it has become a dwelling place of what? Demons. There you are. And a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. That's where they stay for a thousand years. That's what the scripture says. There is so much in, in the Bible that you infer because it's not clearly stated. And that's where so many people wrong. They infer what they want to be in there. Or it's carelessness. It doesn't say in Revelation 20 verse 3 that Satan and all of his even, even, uh, evil, evil angels go down. It just says that Satan goes down. Because two chapters before it tells you where the evil angels were gone. In prison in the ruins of uh, Babylon for a thousand years. And so finally, after the thousand years, Satan is let loose with Gog, the high-ranking angel who followed Satan into rebellion, and energized the final act of evil that the last rebellion uh, is against Jesus in the camp of the saints around Jerusalem. So the last act of this world is the great white throne judgment which discerns between the saved and the lost, and as verse 15 of Revelation 20 says, if third class condition contingent on faith, if anyone's name is not found in the book of life, they are cast into the lake of fire. Have you had enough of evil? Because quite frankly, I have. I have. There's... When I was growing up, I was growing up in an area of snow-capped alpine mountains, beautiful, um, clear lakes, flowing rivers, 
um, never had a care in my life. Uh, and uh, lovely parents, um, and she only lived just up the road. So uh, she wanted to marry a Swiss count. Um, <laughs> boy, she missed by that much. <laughs> Um, and so we've been together, you know, for 47 years. But we had, we had good times and at tough times also. But this last two years has just blown my mind. Because it's been planned for decades. Decades. And do you know what Martin Armstrong said in one of his posts? He said this was actually planned for 2050. And then the people who got the thing already set to go said, we don't want to wait till 2050. We will be very old by then. We'll bring it back to 2030. Remember Agenda 2030? That's what it was all about. And the leak from the Wuhan lab was an accident. It wasn't supposed to happen. That's why they had to hurry and scurry together these things called the death shots in a hurry and they have failed miserably to do what was supposed to happen in 2030 which is to kill 90% of the human race. They've failed. And so every... Look, I, t I preached to this church months and months and months ago saying this all has to fail. Why? Because it doesn't revive again until Revelation chapter 13. It doesn't come back until Revelation 13. So we're seeing, seeing this pullback of nations all around the world saying, no, we're not going to go down this track anymore. And it's failed miserably. The only thing I'm wondering about now is, um, can, you, can you put up that, uh, those three um, um, things I asked you to do? The first one being you-know-who. It doesn't matter who we look at next. Understand this. He's the master conspirator. What he wants is his own uh, kingdom on this earth and to beat Jesus to the punch. Do you understand? That's what all of this is about. Forget McGowan, forget Andrews, forget Palaszczuk, forget all of them. They're just bit players in a conspiracy that he is masterminding to bring his kingdom upon this earth. Next one. No, you got the rogues gallery? That's it. Look at the top layer there. I was blown away. I can expect the Rothschilds to be there, the Rockefeller fellows to be there. I didn't expect Lizzie to be there. And you know what? I've got a thick document. I'm not going to tell you because you'll go and try and download it and get yourselves into trouble. Um, it's called the Inner Circle or the Committee of 300. And they're the people that run the whole, whole world because of what happened on Jekyll Island. And you know who is the boss of the bosses? Lizzie. Do you understand that? Every time you dingoes, when the black Rolls Royce goes past you and you go, and she's going like that, she's the head of it. Whoever is the monarch of England is the head of it. And she's about to pass the baton on to who? And Camilla. <laughs> Seriously. They're the trouble. That's where all the money resides. That's where the decisions are made. The next one, John. Look at him. That's Klaus Schwab. And he has, for the last 30 years, run um, um, classes for the upcoming political leaders of this earth. Can you have a look at them there? Scott Morrison. That's Christine Lagarde from Europe. Look at that idiot from Canada. You've got, what's my name again? 
the President of the United Give me it. Have you seen his new appointment to the Cabinet? The guy that disposes nuclear waste? Have you seen it? I'll bring it next week. He's a... Um, oh, oh, you, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He's got pink hair that goes up the centre of his head. He's a transvestite. He... Um, um, no, I won't go any further. There's kids here. No, seriously. Um, and here's, who's, that, who's that lady that looks like a horse that runs my old country? <laughs> and then you've got Bori. They were all in his school. Do you understand? They were all in his academy. And you wonder why they're all singing from the same hymn book? They've been planning this for years. And what were we doing? Just having a good time. Going to church, watching the footy, looking at the odd thing here and there, buying a new house, selling the old one, and we didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes. It's absolutely and utterly unbelievable. And I just want to finish now, because I haven't got very long, but this is it. John 3, 17 to 21. John, please. Is as I've just taken you through a whole sweep of evil from Lucifer to Adam to the Genesis 6, everywhere to the great white throne judgment. But look what John 3 17 to 21. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do you understand? Salvation was offered to everyone because of God's love for you and I. And it's such a trite saying that we've devalued that. But he actually loves us. He actually loves those idiots on that previous thing. He wants them saved. And as one pastor said recently, if you have truly the love of God in your hearts, you want them saved too. That's Christianity. In verse 18, he who believes in him, that's you and I, is not condemned. But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light, him, has come into the world and the saddest statement in the Bible. And men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And I'm going to quickly... What is it? Have I got? I've got a couple of minutes. I can stretch a couple of minutes. This is your psalm for this week, and I want you to go home after I've read it, and I want you to read it and reread it this week. This is our psalm, Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps, encamps around all of those who fear him. Do you know we've got angels around us right now? The same thing when Elisha showed his servant, all of the uh, chariots around them, keeping them safe. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. That's you and I. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil 
and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on you and I, the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and we're crying out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And he guards all his bones, none of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. That you'll save your homework for this week. Father, we've just come through the entire sweep of the whole history of humanity, Father. And Father, it says in uh, chapter 7 of Matthew 7.13, Enter in by the narrow gate, which is Jesus. And many who travel by the wide path through the wide gate go to destruction. But those who find the narrow way through the narrow gate find the entrance to heaven in your presence, Father. And I just pray, Father, for anyone who is listening online who's come to this church or is listening online, if you are so troubled about the world that is around you that you haven't yet made a commitment to Jesus Christ, he is the narrow gate, he is the way to heaven, he is your Lord and Saviour right now of your soul. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together and fellowship so beautifully uh, in the spirit of your presence, Father. And I just ask that you would bless everyone who's been here. Watch over them this week, Father. Bless them with uh, victory. Bless them with health. Bless them with the sense of belonging to your family as your children, Father. And all God's people said, 